I'm going to show you 14 investing and trading strategies that have been proven to work. And actually, at the end, I'm going to show you one bonus strategy that is kind of spooky. These strategies could also be considered philosophies or frameworks or concepts of how to see the world of investing or trading. The reason I like to talk about this today is because when I first started investing 25 years ago, I of course didn't know what I was doing. Like you always do when you don't know what you're doing. I started studying and looking around, trying to figure things out, reading a lot of books, courses, whatever I could find. And I came across the philosophy or investing strategy of value investing. Studied that a great deal over many years and got pretty decent at it. But what became evident over time was that I was missing out on a lot of opportunities that other investors and traders were taking advantage of regularly. For example, in any given year, I was never invested in the top performing stocks. I couldn't invest in things like Bitcoin, for example, when it was developed in 2009 and started to take off. No value investor in his right mind was involved in that simply because you cannot value Bitcoin. Couldn't get involved in stock options, couldn't do all kinds of strategies that were used by some of the best investors and traders in the world. In fact, there were even periods in time in which the stock market was so overvalued, it was very, very difficult to find solid investment opportunity. So I got back to studying and eventually discovered what I was missing. And what I was missing is I did not have other strategies or philosophies or frameworks to see the markets to allow me to take advantage of a wide variety of situations. So it was like I only had one useful tool when in reality I needed an entire toolbox of tools. So since then I've learned a lot more and I would like to share that with you. Some of these strategies I have used personally, others I have not. The ones I have not, I have researched very thoroughly and seen that they've actually been utilized by some very successful investors and traders in their own right. All right, so let's get to it. First, we have value and growth investing. Value investing is based on the idea that an asset's price and an asset's value are not necessarily the same thing. In fact, the idea is that there's periods of time in which an asset's price can be substantially lower than its value and the asset's price can be substantially higher than its value. This can give you opportunities to get a good deal, so to speak, by buying highly undervalued assets and possibly short selling highly overvalued assets. Now, at one time, value and growth were once considered opposing, but today they're more considered to be two sides of the same coin, where in fact, growth does add value, and it's also possible that growth destroys value. Now, we don't have time to go into that, but that is a factor in some cases. You can use value investing and growth investing in a wide variety of situations. For example, if you go out to buy entire companies, investing in real estate, possibly even drilling oil wells, investing in the publicly traded stock market, there's all kinds of situations. It's particularly useful with assets that are highly illiquid. Warren Buffett is probably the most famous value investor in the world. He's famous for using this philosophy to buy companies and invest in publicly traded stocks. I actually discussed value investing in precious metal platinum in one of my videos on my channel. Number two, efficient market hypothesis. Now this is based on the idea that the markets are so competitive, so many investors and traders are tumbling all over each other trying to find edges in the market that all available information is already factored into the market price virtually immediately. From this framework, it is considered a complete waste of time to go out there and do a lot of analysis work and research and all this because you're really not going to theoretically beat the average risk adjusted returns of anyone else in the market. So the idea is you're better off simply keeping your cost and your taxes as low as possible. And you can do this, of course, by buying baskets of stocks, index funds, and so forth in a cost effective way. There are variations on this hypothesis from wheat, semi strong, and strong form. Each has different repercussions we won't go into. Eugene Fama is considered the discoverer of this phenomenon. He actually won a Nobel Prize for his research on this. And many people use this idea to build their portfolio. Number three, trend following, often referred to as momentum investing. This is based on the idea that market prices and fundamental factors can sometimes trend much further in one direction than would normally be expected. The idea is to jump on a trending asset as soon as possible and ride that trend to the end. There are many ways to do this. The turtle traders of the 1980s are among the most well-known trend followers, and some of them have gone on to be very wealthy using this idea. Number four, mean reversion, sometimes called band trading. It is based on the idea that sometimes market prices or fundamental factors can go too far too fast in one direction before they start to snap back or revert back to some sort of mean. This is also why we have the phrase band trading. There are many ways to use this, but generally speaking, it's used as fading a major move. Fading is means to go in the opposite direction in terms of trading. So if a price is starting to crash very dramatically, you would buy very quickly. Sometimes you lose money on this, of course, and a decent percentage of the time it will revert back to a more normal level, allowing an trader investor to profit from it. So real quick, I'm going to show you an example of this. You can see it here. You can actually see a recent stock that spiked up dramatically. It went from about five or six dollars per share and it spiked up to over twenty four dollars a share. But what I'm also not showing you is how dramatic this move really was because it actually got even crazier than that. It went from four or five dollars to over two hundred fifty dollars a share. 
The next day it crashed down to $51, and then over the next few weeks it went right back to where it originally started, which is, like I said, mean reversion. This would have been an opportunity for a short sell and could have made a lot of money off of it. As a warning, be careful, watch your position size. Keep you safe from handling this. This would have been a very dangerous short sell. Crazy ride. Jim Simons of the Medallion Fund is known to have originally started using some kind of mean reversion in their automated systems. Number five, supply and demand. So this is based on the idea that supply and demand imbalances, either in technical terms or in underlying economic fundamental terms, will often lead to higher or lower prices in the long run, and that it's possible for you to position yourself to profit from these moves. Now, there are actually two different versions of supply and demand research. You have the technical version, which is more like order flow, level two quotes on a stock screen. This is stuff that market makers would see. Alternatively, you can have supply and demand in terms of the underlying economics or fundamentals of an asset. The famous investor Jim Rogers is known to use supply and demand analysis when he makes his long-term commodity trades. I discussed a supply and demand imbalance in platinum in a video on my channel. Number six, intermarket connections. And now this is based on the idea that the world is interconnected economically in many amazing ways, and that it's actually possible to profit by understanding these connections and moving into markets that can profit from these connections. Many years ago, there was a book called If It's Raining in Brazil, Buy Starbucks. Of course, the idea behind this is if it's raining in Brazil, you're gonna have a bumper crop in coffee. Therefore, that should cause the supply of coffee to go up significantly, which means, theoretically, the price of coffee will go down. Well, if that happens, then an important cost of goods sold for Starbucks will decline, which means their gross profit margins increase Increase, which theoretically should mean the stock price would go up. Now, as you can imagine, that's a lot of moving parts working at one time. That is the idea behind intermarket connections. It quite literally is like trying to solve a 3D puzzle that's moving all the time. There are many ways to use this. They're interconnected in a wide variety of ways. And there's a lot of things that move around and happen around the world. Also, I'm gonna mention Jim Rogers again here. He's famous for using intermarket connections. One of his most famous quotes is, how can you invest in American steel without understanding what is going on in a Malaysian palm oil? If you're enjoying this video, please hit the like button. Number seven, spreading, not to be confused by spread betting. Spreading is based on the idea that it's possible to utilize financial engineering to create some very unique profit opportunities through the simultaneous purchase and short sell of two or more assets or contracts. For example, over here, you can see a chart of gold in terms of US West Texas crude oil. So what you're gonna find is that in this chart, you can actually see if you had bought gold, let's say back here, and simultaneously short sold oil, you actually would have done pretty well. For a brief moment, let's say you started around $25 or so, at one point you would have got up to, well, quite a bit more <laughs> into the hundreds. And that was because oil practically went to zero at one point. So you can see here that this actually creates a very unique profit opportunity that's actually highly uncorrelated to other market processes and market strategies that you may find. What you can do, for example, is you can buy a million dollars worth of gold and simultaneously short sell a million dollars worth of oil, or vice versa. Short short sell a million dollars worth of gold, simultaneously buy a million dollars worth of oil. So by shorting gold, it's like you sold gold to turn around and buy oil with it, which is a very interesting same thing as any regular financial transaction. By buying assets in terms of other assets or short selling assets in terms of other assets, you start to create a lot of highly uncorrelated situations. Now, spread trading is most known in the options world and the futures contracts. For example, a lot of options, you'll see calendar spreads and vertical spreads. That is a type of spreading, obviously. And in futures contracts, you can have things like the spark spread, which is where you trade the difference between electricity futures and natural gas futures. And of course, there are many other examples of these. You can have them in all kinds of stocks, bonds, commodities, currencies, and so forth. I think some famous spread traders would be Tom Sosnoff and Tony Batista over at the Tasty Trade Network. I would like to say one thing about spreading. You can actually utilize a lot of other strategies within the context of spreading. For example, you can use trend following and mean reversion and even value investing within a spreading kind of situation. Number eight, arbitrage. Now, this is based on the idea that sometimes there are market price discrepancies such that you can buy and sell an asset in two different markets and enjoy a profit between the two of them. Ideally, this creates what's called a riskless profit, but in actual practice, I've never really seen anything such as a riskless profit. There's always some kind of risk that's involved. Now, I would say this is probably the most prevalent of the strategies I've talked about today because most businesses in the world use some variation of arbitrage. For example, Walmart. Walmart buys from its suppliers in one market at a lower price and turns around and sells to its customers customers and 
other markets at much higher prices. So some famous arbitragers would be LTCM or long-term capital management. Ironically, they are a lesson in the dangers of arbitrage trades going badly. Now there are many variations on arbitrage. You can have merger arbitrage, risk arbitrage, value arbitrage, retail arbitrage, convertible arbitrage, interest rate arbitrage. I've actually found the vast majority of famous investors and traders out there at one time or another have utilized arbitrage, but it's usually often a very just one hit, one off. You see an opportunity, you take advantage of it, and then you move on. I actually discussed an arbitrage play in AMC theater stock on my channel. Number nine, seasonal tendencies. Now this is the idea that it's possible to use reoccurring events to be able to predict supply and demand imbalance efficiently that causes prices to rise or fall. For example, the annual cycle of the weather will affect crops. Income tax due dates have a tendency to affect consumer spending. Political elections can change the perceptions of certainty. The famous trader Larry Williams actually once talked about his favorite seasonal trade used to be the egg trade. Eggs were once traded on futures contracts and Larry would be able to take advantage of this. He noticed every year right before Easter, egg prices significantly rose. So obviously every year he would buy a month or two in advance, the prices of eggs would rise and he would sell it at the peak and make some nice little profit. So I'll show you another example of seasonal tendencies. Here's the United States Single Family Home Price Index from the National Association of Realtors. And you can see here that there is a very consistent wave-like pattern. And this occurs during the winter months, you'll see the low end, for example, December, January, February. And during the high peaks of these, you will find that it's usually in the summer months, for example, May, June, or July. And this is obviously because this is people are moving around between schools, school districts, all of this is a factor. It's comfortable to move in the summer and spring and so forth. And so meanwhile, in the winter, it's very uncomfortable to move. It's the end of the year, all kinds of things are going on. You have Christmas and so forth. So this creates this very interesting seasonal tendency that is quite significant by a factor of about 10 to 15% difference between the peaks of the troughs. One might in theory be able to take advantage of this when they go to buy a home. I've actually talked about the seasonal tendencies in housing in one of my other YouTube videos. Number 10, scenario planning. Now, this is a very broad concept. Now it could be argued that pretty much all these strategies I'm talking about today are some variation on scenario planning. What I'm particularly referring to is the wide variety of scenarios that could be devised in which you could pull very profitable reward to risk scenarios out of. Oftentimes with scenario planning, you don't actually have access to a lot of very solid data. And so that's why you kind of have to be imaginative in this process and imagine a wide variety of situations occurring that there may not be any evidence for whatsoever. You can often see this philosophy or strategy used in environments where there's highly unknown outcome. I would say that in many cases, venture capital firms use some form of scenario planning to plan out their investments in a lot of these startup businesses they're involved in. Other examples would be the early investors in cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies had never really been tested before. Nobody even knew if they existed. They're not really had any background or information. It was impossible to not backed by anything. So there wasn't really any available information. So the earliest investors in cryptocurrencies would primarily have come from this strategy of scenario planning. I would say Bill Gurley at Benchmark, who's known for his venture capital investments, probably used some variation on scenario planning quite regularly. Number 11, monetary and debt cycles. Now this is the idea that the markets are highly affected by monetary policy and these debt cycles that occur throughout our economy. So as the money supply expands and contracts, you can actually see markets rise and fall in tandem with this cycle. Because you can see this, you can create very profitable reward to risk scenario. And some of this can be very long lasting. This process often leads to trends, booms, busts, depressions, and crashes. The Austrian business cycle theory is one of the best models I've seen for this process. Many investors use this idea, but I would say among the more famous currently is Ray Dalio. He's well known for his debt cycle theories. Number 12, mass psychology cycles. Now this is based on the idea that humans have natural predictive cycles cycles in our behavior. There are many variations on this idea. One very popular method is the Elliott wave theory, which is the idea that there are many waves on many levels from a grand super cycle that lasts centuries down to sub cycles that last just seconds or minutes. These waves theoretically can be used to find market turning points that you can profit from. The famous trader Paul Tudor Jones is known to use Elliott wave theory to help him time market tops and bottoms. Number 13, mathematical order to the universe. This strategy is based around the idea that the principles behind the universe are based on mathematics and geometry. And this asserts that numbers and relationships among those numbers have some influence on the markets. This includes things like price movements, volatility, price levels, and time. The most popular of these concepts would be the Fibonacci numbers, which you can see here put against the S&P 500 of recent period. And you can see that these various levels from a recent all-time high to a recent swing, very large swing low, theoretically these levels can actually be important there's that 50% mark right there, which, which by the way, 50% is not technically a Fibonacci number, but it is often used in the trading world. And you can see theoretically it's bouncing off of these levels a few times. And in theory,
theory, strong reward to risk scenarios around this. William Dilbert Gann, also known as WD Gann, is probably one of the most famous for using these ideas successfully. Number 14, physical systems that influence human behavior. The idea behind this is that they either influence humans through some kind of energetic way, for example, sunspots, moon cycles, and astrology. There actually does seem to be a significant correlation between ancient high and low points in human civilization and sunspot activity. I've actually heard some old traders talk about how they believe the moon has always had a significant effect on the markets. We don't really talk about that as much. I suspect it's because they're much more automated by computers these days. And also there are some hedge funds that utilize astrology to help them with their signals in the markets. Henry Weingarten is the manager of a fund that specializes in investing through astrology signals. Okay, I'm gonna give you a bonus strategy. Now, I seriously considered not adding this to this video, but I decided at the last minute to go ahead and do so because there is some compelling research on this and some of you will find this very fascinating. So this is number 15, paranormal. Now, I would like to say I have not personally tried any of this paranormal stuff in the investing trading world. I've not tested it. So you kind of just up to you to take it with what you will, but apparently the research is I've seen out there is pretty compelling. Now, this is based on the idea that it's possible to create very unique opportunities in the markets by tapping into something beyond our current understanding of how our universe operates. So for example, I personally know a group of successful traders that I have respect for that had an opportunity to trade with a very successful day trader. She actually seemed to have a sixth sense about turning points in the market. So every day what she would do is she would sit down and meditate for a while and get into sort of this meditative state that she would stay in for about three to four hours. During that time, she would trade the markets actively. The observers had told me it was uncanny her ability to pick bottoms and tops and also follow trends and stick to trends when she was in this meditative state. What was also very interesting is once she was outside of this meditative state, her success was no better than anybody else's. Also, she wasn't particularly successful at higher time frame holding periods. She was very good at picking tops and bottoms like no one they'd ever seen before. Another example would be Russell Targ, who was actually hired by the CIA as part of their psychic spy program. Now, Russell had been asked to participate in a research study that lasted for nine weeks. And what they did, from what I understand, is they used options contracts contracts to and their version of what's called remote viewing to try to predict what options contracts would make the most money the following week. So every week they had a different experiment basically. So it was a nine week experiment lasting nine times. Each week, the way they set it up, they had about a 25% chance of being right. What was remarkable about this study is they were right nine out of nine times, which is there's less than one in a hundred thousand chance that that would happen. So incredibly unlikely and unusual. Okay, so for paranormal Paranormal, the most famous investor who utilizes paranormal happens to also be by far the wealthiest inflation adjusted investor or trader I've mentioned today in this entire video. And that investor is Cornelius Vanderbilt. Cornelius Vanderbilt was known to go to a lot of spiritualists and he would get stock picks from them. And when a reporter once asked him if he had any advice for investors, his response was, do as I do, consult the spirits. One last thing, if you find this video interesting, I highly recommend one of these other videos. You'll probably find them very helpful. Thank you for watching.